Hey, little mice. This is like Mobius vibe right there. If there's a single word that perfectly encapsulates my experience of the Honkai Star Rail beta, it's crisp from the graphics, the UI, to the music, the voice acting, and the gameplay. Though still in beta, there are obviously aspects of it that are still in need of some work, but we'll get to it. Welcome to my second close beta review of Honkai Star Rail, because I couldn't get in the first time. The most apparent thing is the turn-based strategy system that was never attempted before in any MiHoYo game. It's a step away from their traditional fast-paced action formula, which comes with its own positives and negatives. On one hand, it's more relaxing as it's lower paced so you don't need to use much of your gamer energy. I could say something that makes me sound smart like how turn-based strategy allows for meticulous planning to overcome the challenges players may face in their gameplay. But really just sometimes it makes you feel like you are 10 steps ahead of an AI controlled opponent. Because enemies have a finite amount of actions that you can plan around. That said, having to sit through the same attack animation a million times through your hours of gameplay can be a turn off for many people. Because it's boring, it could also feel grindy. And people have different levels of tolerance for these kinds of things. But how exactly depends on the spin each game takes on the turn based formula. So let's see how Star Rail does it. In the game's combat, Characters have a speed value that can be affected by many things. The speedier can perform more actions more often. They either do a basic attack or use their skill unique to their respective selves. Seems simple enough, but using a skill costs skill points, something that can only be gained after using a basic attack. Skill points are persistent throughout a fight and it's the way Star Rail gives player another level of tactical planning. Outside of the conventional pre-battle planning and strategizing, Character attacks also have elements that can be matched with the enemy's weakness to push their action back after repeatedly slamming them with said weaknesses. A system similar to Shin Megami Tensei where you could potentially steamroll your opponents without them being able to do anything. Outside of the turn-based gameplay, the game offers a limited open-world experience that gives a similar vibe to the Rogue series where gameplay takes place in a corridor with alternative paths that often leads to cool rewards. Though the game is still able to find ways to make the stage feel bigger than it actually is by relying on seamless transition between each section of these paths, you can expect many forms of puzzles and monsters of varying threat levels to be spread out around the map. In this exploration part of the gameplay, the game creates another layer of planning by allowing you to initiate combat with a first strike. Paddis with the weakness break system will give you a massive tactical advantage. Similar to the combat phase, you have the choice of a basic attack and a technique, which also has limited uses based on technique points. You could also be the one on the receiving end of this if you are just sitting there like an indecisive person you are. You could say that the joy of turn-based strategy comes from the slower paced, more methodical approach to gameplay as opposed to the fun in the moment in real-time action game. This is not to say a real-time action game doesn't require strategy, but turn-based by design leads much more heavily on the planning aspect. Anyway, what does a usual gacha game daily grind look like in Star Rail? You get free daily quests that vary in completion time plus extra rewards. You have 180 stamina for farming materials. In this game, spending stamina is much easier because you have the auto battle system which can be used on most farming spots because they aren't that hard to begin with. As a person who follows what the MiHoYo team puts out, I guess nowadays you say HoYoers, the design team are always knocking it out of the park which is great because as a gadget game developer, you gotta make marketable, visually appealing characters for your player base to obsess over so they would give you their money. But looking good isn't the only thing that makes the game sales, because people still won't play the game if it feels like shit to play. And Star Rail's visual design complements the gameplay aspect really well. The UI UX is thematic to the game's Space Odyssey theme. It's easy to use and conveys information in a clear and concise way. I never had to look up what each key does to properly play, nor do I need to remember one really because it's already intuitive. A critique that can be brought up is that the game's system is very much similar to what Genshin had. Star Rail has many systems that clearly draws inspiration from Genshin. You have daily commissions, constellations, and artifacts. This time with 6 slots. What you honestly thought you could escape the artifact grind? Just to name a few. Though admittedly, how these systems were implemented here is an improvement from the Genshin formula. For example, you don't need to go through Star Rail's version of as you can claim your rewards right from the interface. 
Star Rail's weapon system called Light Cones solves a problem within both Genshin and Honkai weapon system that is having limited or no alternatives of weapons to put on your characters. Yeah, it's a nice weapon type you got there. Would be better if I don't need to scramble to craft a completely new weapon just to equip you. One thing to note is that by Star Rail not having any equipment you put be physically shown on your characters, it prevents a situation like this from happening, which could be a positive or a negative depending on who you ask. There's nothing wrong with wanting something different, but speaking as a person who is interested in design, there's not much harm in taking old ideas that is out there and making it your own. Not by copying it to a T, but by improving upon and putting your own spin on it. Because there's no such thing as a new idea. I stole that last part from Mark Twain. Now this could just be me, but I feel that what we see here is much more sharp, which I think is very pleasing, especially the eyes, man. YouTube compression won't do me any good, so you gotta take my word for it. But when I'm actually sitting there, I spent a good amount of my time just staring at them eyes. The camera controls this time around allowed for a bit more movement that makes it easier for me to look at my wife much all day. Anyway, I'm pretty sure that the graphics presets aren't implemented yet because I literally cannot see a significant difference between them. And because of that, I wouldn't be giving the game such a hard time in this section. For what's done, it's coming a long way. The city plaza looks lively enough for a semi-post-apocalyptic setting. What I would expect a lighter tone anime frostpunk would look like. But it's the music that really sells the atmosphere of each area, because many of them literally looks the same, which I'm sure would be changed. The voice acting? It's solid. I play in English, and to my non-native ears, the voice lines are natural and fluid, and perfectly fits the speaker with very few exceptions. Kokolia sounds as crazy as I expected her to be. I never knew I needed to hear the voice of the returning faces like Bronya and Sele in English until I saw their dynamics, which brings me to my favorite part of the game. You see, as a Honkai player, I too wonder what this word in the game's name has anything to do with it. And after playing through the beta, I still have no clue outside of the few theories I've thought up to make sense of it. Maybe it's too early to say, but the familiar faces we see here are clearly not the same bunch we saw in Honkai 3rd, with one possible exception. If you are interested in a more thorough review of the game's lore, check out this video where I summarize the forces at work in the Star Wars universe. Anyway, here are some interesting faces that I think are noteworthy. March 7th, some might call her Comic Relief. She reminds me a lot of Amber, but better, because she, she's waifu material. The antics she comes up with are somehow always entertaining, especially paired up with Dan Heng, who has the ability to come up with snarky remarks that would leave anyone with an acute case of the emotional damage. Apologies, but when March 7th speaks, I feel my brain cells committing suicide one by one. Bronnie Randy. That's right, people. She's not Miss Seishik anymore. She's Miss Rand. She goes through quite a bit of character development throughout the story, which was an endearing experience. You also have Miss Always About to Throw Hands, Sele, as she falls in love with Bronya over the course of the story. That was an over-exaggeration, but you should see it for yourself and tell me what it is. So would I play Star Rail when it comes out? Hell yeah! But should you play it? It obviously depends on your enjoyment of turn-based gameplay. Because if you're someone coming from live-action games that Mihoyo is well known for, you won't be getting as much adrenaline rush as much as you would compared to say, barely dodging a boss attack while you're like one hit away from death. If you are familiar with Genshin systems, it wouldn't take much to get into what we have in Star Rail. While the gameplay has its own enjoyment value different from your typical live-action, at its core, the work that goes into creating the overall experience makes up for the different enjoyment I get in games from this genre, as I myself can find enjoyment in both turn-based and live action, as they have their own flavors to them. But what do you think? Let me know why you would decide to try or not to try Star Rail. Thank you for watching today's review. Have a great day.